This is Tyler, your antisocial critic and the host of the Antisocial Network, your number one source for anachronistic conversations online. Come join us each week to hear opinions from some of the best voices discussing entertainment, politics, religion, and modern life on the internet today. Most of which you've never heard of, but I have. Today we are joined by Bill Ryan, a writer for That Face You Hate, The Bulwark, and formerly of Rebeler Media, where I used to write as well. How's it going today? Going pretty well. How about you? Pretty good. It's, you know, it's, it's a work day, so you know it, it's, it's easy to get very worn out, but it, it is what it is, and you know, it's, it's, yeah. I, love, I, love my, I love my job, so I can't really complain <laughs> that much. So. Shirley, Shirley, I'm sorry, to, but she's gonna start jumping on the table he he promised I'll... quality cat content so we if if, if 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 the cats appear this is a feature not a bug oh is this gonna be actually is this actually a video podcast if you don't if you, um, only, only, uh it is on my end i can cut your side if you don't want to no i don't around. no it's fine i don't it's fine all right i i didn't know if it mattered to you or not because i mean i have some people no. that protect their anonymity so no all right, cool. So we both watched uh, Tragedy of Macbeth. I saw it a little bit before everyone else because it started. It got an art theater drop a couple of weeks ago, but you, uh, it seems like the internet just kind of uh, all saw it at once. It was actually a pretty decently sized uh, conversation online this weekend. Uh, mm-hmm. what, do you, what, what are your initial thoughts on it? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I loved it. Um, as you probably know, I'm a very big fan of the Coen brothers um, and now Joel Cohen specifically. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll try to keep this part brief since we're just starting, but, you know, the thing that I was most excited about going into this film, and it's, I would say, uh, it's the fourth of what are, would now be the big four Macbeth adaptations um, on film, the Kurosawa, the Wells, and the Polanski before this. And the thing I was most excited about was what would Joel Cohen do with the witches? Um, and that was incredible to me. I, I don't think it's ever been done better. I don't know that this is my favorite of the big four Macbeth movies, but that the Catherine Hunter as the three witches was mind blowing to me. Oh yeah. I, I, I this, this is a very cold movie at times and it's very dry uh-huh. and dialogue driven, but the, the times where it splashes into like, like, um, like surrealist imagery are just m- incredible the way it just handles it like everything is going is very quiet one moment and all of a sudden something amazing happens like well no go ahead i was gonna say my standout was the uh the moment very towards the end where he uh assassinates the man who comes into the throne room to, to kill him and the whole room mm-hmm. just turns into a forest and just and you see the leaves just flying around yeah. all the time that was another thing uh the you know the you know burnham wood will um, come to the castle. I don't remember the line specifically, but that's the prophecy. And, you know, Macbeth's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Uh, but, so every every filmmaker has to figure out a way to visualize that. And, you know, in the, the story, it's the, the soldiers, the, the invading, or the, the storming soldiers cut down big chunks of trees and hold them as camouflage in front of them as they advance. And each director obviously has to find a way to make that look interesting. And although there is a shot in the Cohen movie of the soldiers holding the branches up in front of them, the real visual um, component, the way he communicates what's happening, is when Macbeth, I mean, what you're talking about with the leaves, when he opens the windows and the leaves just come pouring and like it's a blast of wind just blows all these leaves from Burnham Wood into his face, and I thought that was pretty great too. Uh, I, I guess mm-hmm. I was kind of conflating both scenes, but yeah, there's two different scenes where that happens, and both of them are amazingly visual. A lot of just because it's very subtle in the background stuff, like mm-hmm. you know, he's just, the the background just seems to melt away around him. It's like it's, I mean, the the, the whole film is very minimalist in its approach. So mm-hmm. like the, these changes are very progressively happening slowly in the background, and every once in a while they just burst to the front but i mean going mm-hmm. back to joel cohen part of the reason i wanted to talk to you about it specifically is because you had a very good piece in the bulwark uh some late last year about uh the retirement of ethan cohen and i was kind of hoping you could go into that real quick and you know, <clears throat> that into the discussion a little bit well um you know i've been uh, they've been very important filmmakers for me since 
uh, well, the first one I ever saw was Raising Arizona on VHS, and the first one I saw in theaters was Winter's Crossing, which is, to this day, my favorite movie. And so I have a long history, that's their third film, and I, so I have a long history with them. And, <clears throat> I don't know, when I heard that Ethan Cohen was retiring, and going to theater, which is not really retiring, but just moving to focus on theater, which is kind of ironic, given this movie, but, um, he, I, I, you know, you can't help but wonder, you know, because they co-directed. Their early credits were Joel Cohen directed, Ethan Cohen produced, and they both wrote, but that was just arbitrary. <clears throat> and they dropped and they changed the credits over the years. And you don't know, uh, unless you're actually someone who's worked with them or know them, like who, who contributes specifically what to each film, and is there something that Ethan Cohen brought to the moves, those movies that was a specialty of his. I just don't know. And I was wondering when I wrote and when the Bulwark piece, I speculated without offering any ideas because I just didn't know what it would something be lost. Um, would, the, would, would Joel Cohen carrying on still seem like the two of them were making these movies or, would it just even not even worse, not necessarily worse, but would it be very different? And I will say that I think Tragedy Macbeth is pretty different in some ways, but when we get deeper into it, there's a way in which it very much isn't. Yeah, I think that was that was my open question going into it because I really didn't know how much, you know, what what creative partner was bringing what into the relationship, <clears throat> and was like was it, it's it's really hard to tell. I mean, you you had you brought up the uh, the very famous, I see cat. Yeah, that's a tail. <laughs> You brought up the very famous article from back in when Inside Lewin Davis came out, where you, where that movie was read to be like a subtextual, uh, you know, I, uh, implication about what these two artists thought about each other's working relationship, and that this they they might be feel somewhat lost from one another without mm. the ability to work to collab together. Yeah. Do, do you? I mean, just as, as a a quick summary, do you think that there is any sort of uh, clear demarcation that we see in this film? Well, it's a little early to tell. Um, oh, Kingsley, come on. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> he, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's. I said it before it's ironic that Ethan Cohen left to do to focus on theater, and the first thing Joel Cohen does is a very um, theatrical adaptation of a play. Um, it does seem very different to me visually in a lot of ways. I mean, there's a lot of digital stuff, which I think he only did because he didn't have any choice, but that's sort of new for them. Um, or, uh, and I just, I just need to see what he's going to do next because I don't know that this is a really, this movie is really a way to gauge anything um, at this point because um, it's, <sighs> I could I could imagine this movie being very similar had Ethan Cohen also been working on it, but I don't. It's I I, I need to see what Joel Cohen is going to do next, and I'm uh, I'm very intrigued to see what that will be. But it'll probably be three years before anything. <clears throat> well, you said you've read some of his uh, uh, Ethan Cohen's poetry and stuff outside of film. What 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 did you take away from those? Well, I I haven't read a lot of the poetry he wrote. A, I have read some though, and he wrote a book of short stories um, back in like '99 or something, '98, '99, something like that, called *The Gates of Eden*. And that is that you know all of the, frequently their films are very funny, even even the non comedies um, have a lot of jokes in them. Um, and I don't remember a story in *Gates of Eden* that didn't have a lot of jokes, and I. It, I do wonder if that was if if there's one thing that Ethan Cohen contributed more than Joel Cohen, if maybe it was the humor. That'd be interesting if that was the case. I mean, it, it's it's really hard to tell where the Cohen where Joel Cohen's going to go at this point because I know in a lot of his interviews, apparently they they've had like a whole lineup of scripts that just haven't developed anything. So I'm curious if Joel's going to go into the into the vault for his next film. Or if they're just going to, or if he's just going to go off on his own from this point on and just do his own thing, and just yeah, I've actually wondered that myself when I was reading the article about. <clears throat> um, there was an article that came out. I don't. It might have been New York Times 
uh, shortly before I think Macbeth premiered at uh, the New York Film Festival, and they mentioned that about all the scripts that they'd written that they thought were good. Not like they said, well, this isn't any good, so we're not going to do it. They just have written so many scripts that they just have, they can't make everything. <clears throat> and so I did wonder if he'd do that. I'm sure Ethan wouldn't say, no, you can't do that. Because <laughs> it's not like they broke up. It's not like they're feuding or anything, from yeah. my understanding. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how those eventually filter their way out. Because you think, because we already saw a lot of Coen Brothers scripts get adapted by, you know, Spielberg and... Uh, mm -hmm. I think the Unbroke... Oh, what was that? That Unbroken movie? Um, yeah, uh, I think that's what it's called. I never saw that. I didn't either. I just know that was big, but they wrote it for some reason. Uh, I they, think both in that and Bridge of Spies, I think someone else wrote the original script, and then they were asked to come in and rewrite it. I think, I'm think i sure that's the case with Bridge of Spies. Unbroken, I don't know. It might have even been the other way around, which would be an odd thing to have someone come in and rewrite the Coens, but who knows? Yeah, and it was weird because the Bridge of Spies felt like such a Spielberg movie. That I, I, I'd have to watch it again to see how much it actually feels like a Coen Brothers movie to some degree. But There are parts that feel very Coen-esque to me. Um, Tom Hanks' first scene at the bar talking to the other insurance lawyer uh, is great and really seems to have their rhythms. Okay, so I, I guess what, moving back into Macbeth, how do you think that this works as a Coen Brothers movie in relation to the other films. Like, it's obviously... Well, that... There was a good tweet I saw from uh, one of the Roger Ebert writers who said that he kind of thought that Macbeth was kind of a... It echoed uh, the other protagonists, like uh, the one from No Country for Old Men or Fargo, where these, you know, men who try to get something more out of life but destroy themselves because the thing they want is either absurd or too much, and it just destroys them in some respect. Well, that that's part. Of, that's what. I, even though it, there's a lot about it that visually looks different from um, what they did together, you know, because of the minimalism and the the, the clearly art, some of the the sets and even outdoor uh, uh, landscapes seem intentionally kind of um, unrealistic, like like it's a play almost, but. If the Coen brothers were, if either of them or both of them were ever going to adapt a Shakespeare play, Macbeth would be my would have been my first guess because it's basically, obviously it predates this by hundreds and hundreds of years, but it's basically Shakespeare's noir play. He he had a couple. Othello's also like that, but, um, but Macbeth is like the the total noir story. Uh, a, a man whose ambition and also uh, a his, his his ambition and obsession with a woman um, lead him to evil, and um, you know sometimes the more the guy gets away with it, but sometimes they don't. And you know, so this movie, <clears throat> it's not just because it's in black and white, but it really reminded me in a lot of ways of um, the man who wasn't there. Um, it seemed like because it's the same thing with. Uh, Ed Crane, Billy Bob Thornton's character in that. Um, his obsession with Scarlett Johansson isn't really the catalyst for what he does, but there's still that element, and he still commits murder to gain something, and even though he's a lot more... He's not as uh, aggressive in a general, in a, in a everyday sort of way, by no means is he hence the title, like, it's always dissimilar from Macbeth like that, but that's their most explicit homage to noir, and they've made lots of crime films, um, so this just seemed, this seemed like almost like a revisiting uh, of the man who wasn't there in some ways, and then there's the, the look of it, the, the black and white is part of that. I mean, part of the look, it, it, I mean, I, part of me wondered how much of that came directly out of A24, because they're whatever they do internally, it has a habit of looking very similar. A lot of the time, like you, they have like the very similar visual styles that kind of repeat film to film. Even though a lot of them are location shot, but you know you can kind of see shades of like the lighthouse in this in terms of its style and editing. I, I, I get the sense that a lot of their films kind of have the same color grading and editors behind them. But I, I well, maybe, but um, there were shots in this that. The way uh, the shadow and light were used in contrast, that like I was thinking about 
I don't know the last time you saw the man who wasn't there, but um, uh, Tony Shalhoub as the lawyer when he's visiting Billy Bob Thornton in jail and they're in the, you know, the interrogation room, I guess. And the way the light pours through the bars in the one window and how it kind of uh, splits Tony Shalhoub into light and shadow and there's stuff like, there's shots like that in, um, in Macbeth where you're uh, Denzel Washington's passing through rooms that have, you know, obviously back then all they had was sunlight and candles. So he's passing through a room that has no illumination but the windows, and he goes from light to dark to light to dark. And I explicitly thought of a uh, man who wasn't there. I had the same thought. It's been a few years since I've watched The Man Who Wasn't There, but especially with the ending of The Man Who Wasn't There, just the, you know, the bleakness of it and, like, the... Like the just watching a man just kind of get exactly what he deserves at the end of his story, so it, it just mm-hmm. it, it echoed a lot, even visually and story wise. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's the movie that I thought of almost. I don't know if I was thinking. I feel like I was thinking about it during when I was actually watching it, but if not, immediately after it just I started. It just clicked for me that this is sort of another version of the man who wasn't there, but with witches. But then Man Who Wasn't There had UFOs, sort of, so. Well, let's go back to the witches, then. What what did you find particularly interesting about them in comparison <clears throat> to the other filmic adaptations? Well, I one of the reasons I, w- I couldn't wait to see what he did was because I think um, Joel and or Ethan Cohen could make a spectacular horror film, which they kind of already did with Barton Fink, but um, this would be the most um, direct... Um, attempt at horror imagery, I assumed, and turned out to be correct that either of them had had done. And I don't know. I the idea to just cast one woman as all three, <clears throat> Catherine Hunter, who I thought must have some sort of dance background because of the way she moved at times. But I looked her up, and I don't think she does. She's just been doing Shakespeare forever. Um, but um, it was very unnerving. It was very unsettling watching her move and. Um, like my, I was talking to my wife afterwards, <clears throat> and she was talking about, you know, the first time you see her, she's kneeling in the sand or dirt, and she's crouched over with her face. Um, she's face down in, in the, the sand, and Catherine and I are both like, and then she turns her head and starts talking, but she's like, why is she doing that? <laughs> like, what is, like, there's all these weird things she does that are like, what is that about? And it just, it's very unsettling. And also in that first scene with her when she's talking, you do see her later as three distinct figures. But when you first see her, it's just one. And the way uh, Cohen cuts that scene when she's talking, it's like it's one person being three people, but with only one form. We also see uh, you also see two or sh- two shadows of her in the water in that shot too. So you, they're technically uh, later, yeah. When when Macbeth and uh, uh, Banquo um, meet her, yeah, there's that like pool in front of her, and it's just one figure and then two reflections underneath her. And I thought that's that's really good. <laughs> that's that's a great idea. Yeah, I, they. I mean, they they they're saying very creepy and distant in this i I like that a lot i mean i I, like the the visuals just for the uh the final double double toil and trouble scene were amazing in the way that they kind of depicted the uh you know the voice that's talking to macbeth it's the you know the the face in the water and yeah the water just kind of creeps up in the room it's very and it's like a little it's like a boy's face yeah Uh, yeah yeah I i i found i found all of that stuff extremely effective and like that's that's what I was hoping for. I didn't know any. I didn't have any specific thoughts about what he might do. I did know going in that only one actress um, had been cast, but beyond that, I didn't have an idea. And I, I could not have been more satisfied with what he did with that. What do you think uh, Joel brings to the brings out of the material that's different from the other adaptations? Well, a lot of people have said, and correctly, that it does seem to owe his movie does seem to owe a lot to Orson Welles's movie because wells also had the slightly artificial seeming sets um and big wide shots of 
of um, castle floors with no furniture but pillars and like you know these like I don't know if foyer would be the right word but big rooms that are just like passageways to other smaller areas and so I don't know uh, he I thought that he brought a, it was the smaller things, the, the more distinct things that he had. These there's big things that you have to deal with when you're doing Macbeth, um, the witches, Burnham Wood, <clears throat> that sort of thing, and also the violence. Which the movie was a lot less graphic than I thought it was going to be because their movies can be really graphic, um, and it's, it wasn't particularly. But I think that he brought brand new ideas to those big things that you have to concern yourself with when adapting it you know the burnham wood being represented by the leaves blowing through the window the witch which is being one woman but also three women he he, he brought whatever he, he it owes to the wells and i'm sure he's a huge wells fan i know he is he brought he didn't mimic he didn't copy any of the big stuff um and you know the polanski movie is um very broadly speaking realistic not the language obviously but the look of it and the violence of it and then the kurosawa which i still think might be my favorite um that's a lot more that 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 is closer to this one in some ways than the wells because as i remember it's been a while since i've seen the wells but his take on the witches is also very horror film like um and uh but it's different than the way joel cohen did it so he, he brought fresh ideas to things that should have been done a million times, um, and they seem brand new. I'm always curious, like, what the, you know, what someone wants to bring to this stuff. I mean, obviously, at some point, it, anyone that works in this kind of particular corner of Hollywood wants to hit Shakespeare, because it's the thing you want to challenge yourself with, because it, it, at times I was kind of afraid he might be a little too reticent to rely on the language. I mean... It kind of it kind of reminded me of uh, you know I I don't of, of all the people that are term to be reminded of the uh, the the Joss Whedon Much Ado About Nothing where he <laughs> is a you know a, a, a director who's very famous for his dialogue it you know completely gives up his dialogue and lets the lets Shakespeare do all the talking for him and then just makes a very minimalist movie around it so at times I was worried it might be a little bit too not uh, not not unengaging but dry. And at, and at times he it, it is a very quiet movie. It kind of reminds me of like the uh, the Lawrence Olivier Hamlet at times, where there's not a lot happening, but the because it, it, the characters are just kind of standing and monologuing, and as opposed to the like the Wells Shakespeare's, where there's constant movements and mm-hmm. very huge creative choices happening all the time. So it's, it's kind of like halfway between those two different approaches to Shakespeare, which you know it, it's all about the word. It can it can work in either context, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I've obviously <laughs> never adapted Shakespeare, but it, just thinking about it, if unless it's a translation, because obviously the Kurosawa movie doesn't use the language at all. It's you know, it uses the themes and the story and the the um, everything but the language essentially. So, I, it, it, but it seems to me that if you're going to adapt it, it's largely a matter of editing. Like, what do you keep in? And what do you leave? What do you take out from the, the language? Um, it is his shortest play. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. So, and the movie's an hour, forty minutes. So I don't know that much needed to be cut. But I, I believe it's been a while since I read the play. But I think that when Macbeth murders Duncan, <clears throat> he says quite a bit in the play. I don't think he says anything in this. The one I was reading the Guardian, and he says in. in his interview with him that the one line that he changed or the, the most prominent line he changed was uh uh i forget exactly which one but i think it was the it, it was one of the lines per, uh, pertinent to uh lady macbeth and her uh her age and her ability to reproduce because obviously because one of cohen's uh, artistic decisions here was that he wanted to make uh, age up the characters a bit yeah and he, he called it the postmenopausal macbeth so the idea we, these are you know these are characters who just by by right of their age just can't will not have a, a a line after them. So it's not just that they're 
going to die before they can bring a child into the world is that they actually can't bring a child into the right. world. Yeah, that was the big impetus for making this movie because my understanding is, is, excuse me, Francis McDormand had done this on stage not, I don't know how many years ago, but not, you know, in her younger days, like five, six, seven years ago, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, he, he went to see her, obviously, and it just struck a chord. And that was one of her big things, what you're talking about, is that usually when Macbeth is produced, the characters are younger. And here they're, you know, if there's anything that you're going to get out, more out of this life, you're going to have to take it because you're not going to live long enough for it to just happen in a natural sort of way. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious how if that affects the themes of the play at all beyond just kind of highlighting that one detail because you know it, the the temptation to mutilate Shakespeare is the you know the great temptation of every adaptation. I mean, yeah. The, the, I, I can I can I can, I'll throw a there's a good Charles Krauthammer piece about where he talks about like all the hor the horrifically new age uh, Shakespeare adaptations that were happening in around him in the early in, in the late 90s that I can that yeah. that's fun that's worth reading but like there's there's a lot of you know people changing details that doesn't that actually violently affects the themes yeah well I mean I think that's a fair enough way to do it if otherwise you're just gonna be I mean granted that's not what Joel Cohen did other than, cha you know, yeah, aging, the... aging up the characters. But I think it's a fair enough um, idea in in general, and I think some good movies have been made like that. But someone, I think Sean Burns, and I wish I could remember the name of the movie. It was exactly what you're talking about. It was a 90s uh, uh, film of... Uh, Adaptation of Shakespeare. I don't know if they use the language, and it's called Men. I'm gonna get it wrong. Anyway, it's it's like a set amongst, if not actual mafia, then like you know a group of criminals. And ben, the Banquo character, I think he's was named Banky Cuomo, <laughs> which is so stupid and pointless. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. I'm not saying there wasn't. Oh man, that's awful. <laughs> like I, I, I'm fine with taking the plot of a Shakespeare play and just doing it in a completely different context. But that that middle approach, the like the Romeo plus Juliet approach, where you yeah, modern dialogue in a modern or, or, or 16th century dialogue in a modern setting is just like the worst of both worlds. It seems unless you are just yeah. unless you're just doing the ultra minimalist approach. Yeah, I don't know. I there's a uh, I'm sure I, you may have seen it. I'm sure you've heard of it at any way at any rate. But there's a Hamlet, the one with uh, Ethan Hawke. Oh, I've I've seen I've seen bits of it. I haven't watched it, but I, I've heard it's very good, and I like the director. I can't his, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but I I I've liked other movies by him. It's like well, I'll give it a shot. It 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 repels me on its face, <laughs> but I do like the director, and I've and people have said it's actually really good so i'll give it a shot sometime but it, it... I, I saw the title or the i saw the the cover page like a used dvd store and i just got like like jesse eisenberg and uh social and social network vibes coming off of it i'm like this is not a good combination of vibes i'm getting off of this dvd right now <laughs> well it's my understanding and i could i probably shouldn't mention it since i haven't seen the movie and i might get this detail wrong but it's my understanding and again if i didn't like this director i would just say no thank you but apparently, if I'm remembering correctly, the to be or not to be uh, soliloquy uh, is said in, like, a blockbuster. <laughs> Something like that. What the heck? This maybe movie not, sounds maybe, great! <laughs> maybe not specifically maybe not specifically blockbuster, but a video store in any case. Oh my gosh, that reminds me, there was a an audiobook of someone, someone recorded a bunch of the old uh, Star Trek novelizations, and... It is, there's a random line in it where they're apparently reading or they're attending a Shakespeare production that's been of modernized Shakespeare, and someone does that speech and it cuts it from Kirk saying, "You know, I like the original speech. I don't understand why someone doesn't understand it." Cut to the speech. Should I kill myself? That's a question. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's that. I kind of get where you're coming from, Kirk. But <laughs> so I mean, back to the the movie. Do you, do you think that there was a greater impetus for wanting to make a movie like this at this point? I mean, beyond just the uh, the personal one, because obviously there's a challenge to it as a you know as a classicist wanting to do this kind of production, especially for 
you know, Joel wanting to give his wife a kind, that kind of performance. But do you think that there's more to it than that? Because I kind of felt like there's there, there might be something to just how heavy the atmosphere is. Like, you know, it, it felt semi-contemporary in regards to just how... Yeah, but when did they film it, though? Or he, that was... I, I have to think 2019. They said that they started... Oh, they did have to shut it down, didn't they? they did yeah, shut it down. so... They started 2019, but, shut down, and then probably finished in sometime in 2020. But still, they started it before all of this happened, you know. Um, so this is a boring answer, but I don't. I I kind of think no is the answer. I think that it, because she had done the play and he was so taken with what she did with it, and also the age thing that you brought up, and also I think coincidentally he had just gotten to know Denzel Washington. And they'd been talking about wanting to work together. And when the idea to do this came along and to age up the characters, he was like, I got it. So that's what I, that's my feeling anyway. We hadn't brought up Denzel yet, but he is very good in this. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect him to be anything, but I, I thought the decision to cast him was a brilliant one. I think he's, he's one of the great living actors. Um, I had no doubt that he would just, absolutely destroy this is a scene one of my favorite scenes in the movie and it's just him acting i'm gonna say acting because i don't know if you saw <clears throat> that awful tweet that went around from i'll just say her name sasha stone who said there's only so much you can do when you have actors read shakespeare oh my i that I, the, the, yeah the uh it's like there's only so much you can do with shakespeare i'm like well no but it was specifically there's only so much you can do when an actor read when you're having an actor read shakespeare so they're standing there with a script in their hand. So, anyway, <laughs> that bothered me. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's this, the soliloquy where he's he's just uh, Lady Macbeth has just convinced him to murder Duncan, and he, you know, I'm not going to remember any of the language, but he um, is walking around thinking about it, and there's a point where he's uh, the gist of what he's saying is. I don't want to do this. I don't think I'm going to do this. And you see, in you know, he's reading, he, reading. He's performing the lines, and and I know this. He's a great actor, and this is something great actors can do. But I was, it really hit me watching him in this context. Um, he just kind of tilts his head back, and is saying, you know, saying the, the words, and you just see his eyes well up. The, the tears never like spill out, but you see his, his eyes well up and. His expression change and he gets like glassy eyed like you do when you start to well up and he's just like i don't want to do this i, I just don't want to kill this man and then he, of course he does it but i that just really that was like from, from him that was the scene i thought was that the hallway scene where that led up to the murder or no no it was earlier because the hallway scene the is that a dagger i see before me he he was all he was revving himself up for it at that point um this was i think if not the next scene after he and lady Macbeth talked about doing this it was at least a scene or two later it was pretty soon after that okay i was gonna say that scene in particular stood out to me because I, I like the way that joel uses this the uh, the staging in that scene just to create that ant anticipation of just kind of you know, slowly walking towards your fate with every single step and knowing you that you're this is your decision that you've resolved yourself to it. I mean, it, it, it kind of it kind of stood against like the Fassbender version from a couple of years back because I recall in that version the the decision he makes the decision to kill Macduff during a sex scene, which <laughs> kind of <laughs> undermines any sort of thematic weight to that moment if. He's just making a hedonistic, impulsive decision. So That's the kind of dumb idea that someone thinks, like, I know how to jazz up Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, that just, it just does nothing. Yeah, talk about mutilating the text for your own benefit. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's a good example of it right there. But I like the, I like how much, uh, that, how deliberate that scene is. Like, you know this guy is making this decision every single step, and he could have stopped right. at any point. But He's talking himself into it, whereas in the scene that I was talking about, he's trying to talk himself out of it, and now he's talking himself into it, and it, it's really great. Yeah. Is there anything... We, I, I was gonna, I'm was i trying to think if there's anything we haven't covered, but... Well, uh, we haven't mentioned McDormand, who's obviously uh, wonderful. She's in it. 
And I guess the character is in it much less than I remembered in general, because she disappears for big chunks, especially when Macduff comes into it, um, and 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 you start seeing more things from his from his point of view. Um, they both disappear for a while. Um, but she was wonderful and very. Uh, she put, underplayed it a lot more than I thought she was going to, because she can go all sorts of directions. Um, I've seen her do like just within the Coen Brothers movies themselves. She can go very big or she can go really small and she went pretty small here i thought but effectively so yeah i the the standout for me i think was probably Corey hawkins as mcduff i mean i thought he was great i i i i'd seen him in something i I don't remember what it was but i he he really brought a lot of weight to that performance like Mm -hmm. you you really feel like like him being justified like every single step of what's happening like this is guy who deserves what he's get what he's doing like on un- un- unlike unlike Macbeth, who's just right. instigating everything like this is a guy who's like wronged at every level and yeah you, you I, yeah. I i i love that i i, I yeah. need to i need to find more of his stuff because i he brought a lot of grandeur to that role yeah i thought he was terrific as well um and his it was just one scene but and i don't know unfortunately i don't know the actress's name but the woman who played his wife uh she was pretty terrific too in the scene before she and her son are murdered yeah, that was really like I'm. I'm sure that was all out of the play. So it it it, yeah. it, it felt like it was one of a uh, scene that they didn't shorten at all because they wanted to have ev- to you to milk every ounce of pathos out of that scene. Yeah, but, they wanted you to have some time with these two people who were about to be slaughtered. Yeah, and it's it's it doesn't hold back either. It doesn't, it, it, no, they don't they don't go full gore, but you know, kid getting thrown off balcony into a fire is not. Yeah. And, you don't have to be graphic for that to kind of be a kick in the gut. Yeah, it, it, you you really feel it too. I mean, it, it this it, it this it, it, Shakespeare does not hold back from how dark his stories get. So I I appreciated that it, that this doesn't like you know sugarcoat any of it. But it does. It also doesn't go as violent as it could have. Which yeah, I, that that's one thing that really surprised me because you know you look at some of the, you look at No Country for Old Men and some of the stuff that happens in that movie. It's like Jesus Christ, <laughs> that was brutal. I mean, it can, it can, it's very quick most of the time in that movie, but it's brutal, like in graphic. And I thought, well, he's gonna, you know, the Coens have a penchant for this sort of thing, and they do it really well. So they're gonna, so Joel Coen's gonna probably uh, indulge that. But he really, he really didn't. He didn't like keep everything off screen or anything like that. But, but the most graphic it got, other than the boy being thrown. Uh, into the fire <clears throat> it was the it was when Brendan Gleeson was killed because I don't know if it was a trick knife or just really good digital but it really looked like he was shoving a knife into his Adam's apple yeah it's it's a gruesome death uh, but although I'm, I'm kind of wondering how much of that might be an exposure sort of thing because I, I remember going back and you know even back as far as back as the Orson Welles adaptation there's a surprising amount of gore in that I mean by the standards of you know uh, Hollywood at that time when they when they with the production rules like decapitated heads and stabbing yeah. is like there, maybe it, this maybe it's just that Shakespeare is one of those things that's you know it's like Bible adaptations so you, you can get you can automatically get away with a certain amount of violence because it's automatically considered like cultural like it's yeah like, I mean it's Shakespeare and I yeah they probably did you know turn their you know turn a blind eye to that given the uh source yeah i mean maybe maybe this would feel more gruesome if we weren't familiar with the th- with the uh the play already but it, 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 you do you do get to see denzel washington briefly decapitated for like half a frame but yeah have you seen the polanski i saw it once i i didn't that... it, it felt like he was trying to do like a more epic style version of it so it's a little more colorful than some of these adaptations. Uh, i uh I don't know that I would describe it that way. I, the thing that it's been a while for me too, but the thing that the reason I mentioned it is because the violence in that is no joke. He's he is going. He has some really gross ideas that he throws in there that are just like really you know the hairs on your arms stand up watching some of it. I'll I'll watch it again. It's been a long time, but I just didn't remember that one as being as bleak as the other ones just oh it's bleak well it's it, it's, the, it's the movie he made directly after sharon tate's it was the next movie he made after sharon tate was killed oh. and so yeah so people have 
read into the extreme violence in that movie as being a, you know, I'm not, def- I feel like every time you bring up Polanski, you got to say, he's a bad guy, but uh, was that his is. last? Was that his last Hollywood movie? Or was that? No, I don't think so. Okay, I was I wasn't sure. I think he made timeline. he made Chinatown after that. Okay, I, I I don't remember the timeline for how that matches up with what ultimately happens with him. So I. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, other than that, was, was did you have any other major takeaways from the film as a whole, or? Hmm, I don't know. Um, I feel like there was something I was going to say that may have slipped my mind at this point. Um, I will say this is my. Uh, one small problem and this, it's a very very small problem but i'm just going to mention it anyway uh so reading the play um i think you know that's when a lot of it because you watch it's much easier for me to read shakespeare than it is to watch him or listen to him i should say uh language wise obviously and uh, so when i was reading the play um a lot of lines that i had not caught um during film versions that I'd seen uh, were came home and were driven home to me. And one of the murderers, when they kill Banquo, and uh, I think in the play they're hiding in the trees above him while he and his son ride underneath. And it's raining. And Banquo is not aware, aware that they're there. This is my memory of, of the play. Um, and he mentioned something about the rain, and one of the murderers says, let it come down. And then they drop down and kill Banquo, and not his son, obviously, but they tried to. And I thought, that's a really chilling line. And they kind of threw it away with no weight to it in this. Because I was waiting for that, actually. Because uh, I just think the line is so, you know, frightening in a way. But, um, uh, yeah, he didn't really do anything with that, which surprised me. I thought he would make a meal out of that a little bit. I, mean, I guess you can kind of tell which lines were the ones he really wanted to do. I mean, via how cinematic they are. So I guess he's, yeah, you know, every I guess everyone comes to the material and takes away something that's more prescient or more emphasized than others. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm curious to see where Joel goes from this point. I mean, if we do get like a series of ultra bleak coen brother films going forward then i guess it'll kind of tell us where the humor was coming from but maybe maybe he goes and does a straight comedy after this it's it's all up in the air well you know no country for old men is so bleak that i have a hard time watching it now like it, i've watched it many times but the last couple last time i tried to watch is like i don't think i'm up for this right now this is too much but even that has jokes in it not a not a ton but it has jokes in it yeah, the weird part of that is that that movie came out in such close proximity of both Lady Killers and Burn After Reading, which is such very was, stra- very strange yeah. films to bookend that with. But they they like to uh, screw with people. I don't know if it's intentional, but you know they followed up Fargo, which was their biggest uh, success at that time. Uh, they fo- and you know critics went nuts for it, um, and then they followed it up with Big Lebowski. And a lot of people were like, what's this? These these guys made Fargo. It's like, yeah, but they also made Raising Arizona, you know? And uh, so then, yeah, they do. Um, I think The Lady Killers and Intolerable Cruelty was a little bit, I don't know what that was. I like both of those movies more than most people. But that's, they seem to be a little bit lost in the woods at that time. Like, because, you know, one's a remake and the other was not a script that was original to them. They rewrote it, but that had been floating around Hollywood for a while. The mid two thousands was not a kind period to our great directors, to most of our great yeah. directors. So I don't know. I think me. I wonder. I don't know the timeline, but they tried to get this movie to the White Sea off the ground, which would have been amazing. Um, but it fell through, and that may have thrown them off a little bit. I don't know. I'm speculating. But but then yeah, they come back with No Country for Old Men, and it's what in the world? And then Burn After Reading, which is a like, even though that movie is almost as bleak, if not as bleak as uh, No Country for Old Men, it's also like following up Fargo with Big Lebowski because it's just completely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean they I, they kind of have a way of doing the same story twice, at least like thematically. When and but the sec- but the second one is the farce, so it's yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's a good way of washing their uh, you know washing their palates, I guess. That, yeah, that's true because Fargo and Big Lebowski are both kidnapping stories. Although yeah. not really in the case of Big Lebowski, but you think it is. Yeah, and they, they, they kind of, I don't want to say they echo each other fully, but they kind of have similar 
ideas and concepts that kind of echo between them. Same with No Country and Burn After, I guess, to some degree. Yeah. But yeah, that's I, I don't really know if I have any other thoughts, but do you have any other uh, thing you want to wrap up on, or do you want to just kind of plug where you're, where people can find your stuff online? Or uh, No, I don't think I have anything more to add at the moment. I, I should have watched it again. I'd have more to say, but I just didn't get around to it. But uh, I, I do, I don't know when this is going to post. Um, probably, when you... probably a day or two. Okay, well, I currently have a piece in the Bulwark uh, I posted today about John Carpenter, um, just kind of a career retrospective because he just had a birthday. Um, and I have I have a couple pieces, they're not new, but I have a couple pieces at RogerEbert.com, one about Big Night and one about um, Val Luton, the films of Val Luton. I write for The Cider, um, you can find me there. Um, and I have a big career overview very long piece about William Friedkin in the Oscilloscope's Musings uh, blog, which you can you'll find that one pretty easily. So that's that's pretty much it. Is the Friedkin piece up already? Oh, it's been up. It's just you know if I'm gonna plug something, I might as well plug everything. <laughs> sure, that actually sounds that sounds interesting. I'll have to look that up. But yeah, thank I appreciate your time and thank you for coming on to talk about Co the Coen Brothers. I'm sure that wasn't too no. much of a burden though. No, not not that much. Thanks for having me. Sure, have a good day. All right. The Antisocial Network is a Group Think Productions podcast. Editing, producing, and hosting are by Tyler Hummel, artwork by Crystal Cowley, and original music was composed by Melissa LaFira and the late Dan Smola. Like, subscribe, and please let us know what you think about the show in the comments below if you'd like to see anyone interesting be a guest on the show. Thank you for listening.